Good morning, Mr. Benzaken. Yes, good morning, Your Honor. May it please the Court. This case uh, brings to light the numerous problems that arise when the Sex Offender Registry Board uh, attempts to classify a person many years before that person is released from state prison, when many of the factors that they're supposed to consider in the risk assessment analysis have not come into play, where some of the basic questions with respect to, first off, the jurisdiction of the board are, are not yet clear. It, well, does the statute prohibit the, the board from uh, making a determination years in advance? Uh, I'd say the, the statute is, does not explicitly prohibit them, but I'd suggest that there's two things that we look at here. First, uh, on the due process side, I'd suggest that they're not permitted to, and I'd suggest that doing it years in advance would be inconsistent with the past decisions of this court. Um, on that point, when this court had approved the process, uh, this classification process through this series of cases, the assumption there was that the board was determining someone's current risk of reoffense. And in determining someone's current risk of reoffense, that the Sex Offender Registry Board was also applying all of the factors that the legislator identified in 178K. The legislator identified numerous both historical factors and essentially what would be called dynamic factors, factors that change over time and factors that could both show an increase or a decreased risk. But the legislator did not intend, and this court did not approve of a process, which allowed the Sex Offender Registry Board to simply look at the nature of someone's offense and ignore anything else that may occur in that person's life, ignore everything else that may be existing when that person is actually living in the public and would uh, implicate the concerns of the sex offender registry laws. Well, how was the board to know that he wasn't going to be released very shortly? He had been awaiting trial for a long period of time. He could well have been, I mean, he hadn't been sentenced, but it had been going on for some time. Federal sentence, right? Was, he was pending federal sentencing. Correct. How could the, is the board supposed to guess, well, maybe he'll only end up serving another month, maybe six months. I mean, why can't the board proceed to do that? And, and if your client uh, is subsequently released, he can certainly petition for a reclassification, can't he? Yes, but well, I'll answer the second part of it in a moment because I think the, okay. his petition for reclassification, I think, does not satisfy the due process requirements, and it would not make up for, I think, the prejudice that he would suffer from a premature classification. But going back to the first part, this is actually a particularly unique situation because unlike any other offender who would be sentenced under Massachusetts law and put in a, it would be in the custody of a Massachusetts institution, either a House of Correction or the Department of Corrections, they'd be subject to the process under 170 AD. And under 170 AD, as soon as that person is sentenced, the Sex Offender Registry Board is notified by the custodial agency. And the custodial agencies subject to that are all state agencies. And they would know the earliest possible release date and the maximum possible release date. Well, wasn't but, he, in fact, given a, um, a sentence that made him, um, he was going to be released only one month after well, he was it, sentenced? It was unknown. And, 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 but, and, I mean, in fact, he got, a, he got a sentence of only one month more. That resulted, it resulted in only one month more incarceration. That's correct. And that okay. occurred in, in 2008, which was three years after the hearing. Uh, and at the time of the hearing, bear in mind that uh, there was a good faith representation by counsel that he had believed that he was actually looking at an additional six years, did not expect three years. But he had not been sentenced, so had no knowledge about that. But what's unique about him is he falls outside of 17080. He is a federal inmate. You know, the state agency never had custody of him. He was never actually in the custody of either the Barnstable House of Correction or the other houses of corrections that he uh, briefly was physically held at. He was in federal custody. And even he never raised this before the agency or before the Superior Court. The jurisdictional? I mean, no, he did not. It was, it was not raised below at all. Well, I well, raised it for the first time on appeal. When do you say that the Sex Offender Registry Board should classify offenders? Well, I don't take a position necessarily on when they should do a final classification. And, and I say that in acknowledgment of the amicus brief submitted by the CPCS, which raises an issue which was not raised in my brief. But I do suggest that they are certainly allowed to begin uh, the classification process while someone's inside. I, have, I don't at all dispute that. In fact, I think the regulations call for that, that the Sex Offender Registry Board is supposed to look at inmates, start collecting information. And in fact, 178L, I think, spells out a very reasonable time frame for this. You know, I mean, although it says a minimum, it says at least 60 days before someone's supposed to be released, that they should initially start the process, start a line of communication with the offender, inform the offender of his opportunity to present documents both with respect to his risk level as well as his fundamental duty to register. And, and, and that would begin the process. And I think the Sex Offender Registry Board is per, per, per permitted at any point, you know, when they get this information to start collecting the biographical data about an offender and start making a determination. 
and at some point make a preliminary classification and then that allows an offender then to respond to that. Uh, whether a final classification is permitted to occur while he's still incarcerated or not is, is beyond the argument that I have raised. Although I do think it does present some future problems that, that okay, so may be before this court. Your, your question is really because a he well he's federal and and he wasn't even sentenced, so you don't even get there. He, that's correct. And you know I know the concern he could have been released at any time, and <coughs> that's true. But but that's no different than you know any other time the federal government decides to release an inmate from who's never even been for a moment in Massachusetts into into Massachusetts to go on probation or release him to a halfway house here. I mean, we have no control over what the federal government does. If they release a dangerous sex offender, even by our standards, you know, unfortunately we are at their whim uh, of, of dealing with it at that point. That but in this case, all the evidence is that he had always resided here. He, he was born here. He was in custody of DYS. He married here. Mm -hmm. um, so there was, there's no evidence that he's not going to return here. It's not like somebody who committed an offense in Ohio and the feds happen to incarcerate him here and he's probably going to go back to Ohio. And he didn't present any evidence uh, to the contrary. So what is the board supposed to do? Well, the board, as board asserted that it had jurisdiction over him because he was in the jail. And that was the, that was the basis under which they asserted their the jurisdiction over him. And, you know, I think it, it would have been better, and I had wished the trial counsel below had, had raised the arguments I have raised, but they did not. And, and the appeals court accepted. I mean, that's the appeal. It, it, at least that's how I read the appeals court decision as well, mm -hmm. that because he's physically here, there's jurisdiction. Is that the – I would disagree with that, though. No, I'm not, I'm not saying you have to accept it, but that is, is – That's the basis sure. of the yes. appeals court's yes. decision. Yes, that, that he is physically here. And I don't think that's enough. And, and I want to go back. When I, when I say that a, an offender then presents information to the board uh, pursuant to 170, 178E, uh, as soon as they're brought into a custodial agency, where they intend to live, now, in a case such as Doe's, like hypothetically, had he been actually in state custody as opposed to federal custody, what they would have gotten from him then would have been a statement of where he wanted to live. And perhaps he would have stayed in there. I now want to live in Connecticut, or I want to live in, in, in Rhode Island. Now, obviously, I'm not suggesting that the board has to suddenly rely on these assertions, and that becomes determinative of their jurisdiction. I mean, the jurisdiction, it, it, jurisdiction is part of the fact-finding process that the board can, 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 Yeah, go ahead. Can, right, let's assume for a moment and I may have gotten this a little confused, that your client here was being held in state custody mm -hmm. uh, in, on a case but hadn't been sentenced and he'd been held for some time. Mm -hmm. um, you're saying the board would have no jurisdiction over him as well? I would say that they would not have jurisdiction based on his presence in the prison. And that factor, relying on a residency just because someone is in custody in some sort of agency so within the difference here is what? Both of the examples, the, the case here, he hasn't been sentenced, uh, but he's held here, mm -hmm. and he's been a resident here forever, committed his underlying sexual offense here. Correct. And the other is he's here, hasn't been sentenced, but he's held by state authorities. Correct. One but jurisdiction, I, one not? No, no. I, I'd say there, the, the question of jurisdiction has to, in, in a case of an incarcerated offender is, are they going to reside in Massachusetts when they're out? The, the, the sex offender registry laws have no concern about classifying people uh, or the dangers they pose to the public if they're inside. The I take it, Mr. Ben Zaken, if, for example, um, a, uh, a person who's convicted of an applicable sexual offense in a Massachusetts state court, sentenced under the Massachusetts state law, uh, but was being incarcerated in Texas by agreement between, uh, because of overcrowding in Massachusetts and uh, this, uh, you know, under whatever 178L, and the sex offender legislative board knew that the person was going to be released. They could assert jurisdiction over that person in Texas, I assume, uh, because, who's there solely because of overcrowding in Massachusetts, presuming that what will happen is the person will be returned to Massachusetts before he's going to be released, and then you look at the residency there. I think there's a problem with, with, with that if there's no information that they intend to return. No, 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 I understand. Let's assume that, that the way the overcrowding is handled is that the person gets returned but gets returned, you know, 10 days before his presumptive release date and the presumptive release date will be into Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Then I assume if the Sex Offender Legislative Board, knowing that that was going to happen, could commence the process. I still think we have to look at where an offender will actually live. No, no, I understand that. I, but but, but that's, what that you, that's what you've just said. You said, and the offender says, actually, no, you're going to bring me back to Massachusetts, but I'm going to move to Connecticut, 
may not be enough. The board doesn't have to, but it's not a jurisdictional issue. They can begin the process. What you're saying here is there's no basis to begin the process. I'm saying here there was no basis to begin the process, but someone else absolutely would be a basis to begin the process, and I think the offender would be given the opportunity to also respond. You know, I think it'd be reasonable if someone was raised in Massachusetts, you know, with, for example, with those backgrounds, imprisoned within Massachusetts, and if they say, I'm going to move to Puerto Rico afterwards. I'm not suggesting the board is stuck with that. They're certainly exam no, permitted to go ahead and examine. This person has a lifelong history in Massachusetts. We question this process. Mm -hmm. And then as part of the process where they're classifying someone and the offender is given an opportunity, present information to us. I think the board is completely permitted under 178L to suggest, you know, this doesn't quite look consistent with everything else we have. You know, either provide us documentation on why you're doing this. Imprisoning someone is extremely uprooting. I mean, was you, was you, the question of jurisdiction raised before the, uh, the board? No. 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 Are, are you talking about personal jurisdiction or subject matter jurisdiction? Subject matter subject. jurisdiction. With respect, to, with respect to the Sex Offender Registry Board, in their case, their jurisdiction is over the class of persons whom they may regulate. Yeah, and, and if he was under, under sentence in Massachusetts, if, 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 uh, if he was serving his sentence in Massachusetts under a Massachusetts state court mm -hmm. order, um, you wouldn't be arguing this. I might. I, again, I think it would still, the fact that even if he was imprisoned by Massachusetts courts within Mass Massachusetts. Well, well, so if, if, if an inmate says, uh, once he gets notice uh, that the SOAR uh, board is going to begin its proceedings, uh, the inmate says, geez, I intend to, I lived here all my life, but I actually intend to go to Hawaii. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't have jurisdiction over me. Mm -hmm. what, what, what kind of an inquiry do we conduct? Well, I think that's, that's something that the Sex Offender Registry Board would look into. And again, I'd suggest they look at the biographical data they have about this person. In here, everything indicated Massachusetts. Well, I, yes and no. I mean, his history you indicated mean, Massachusetts. Could, could the board have reasonably concluded that he intended to, live in, to return to Massachusetts? I see no basis for this, o main, mostly because, again, he, he was severely uprooted. He was pulled out of Massachusetts for, at the time, he was classified for about five years. Um, well except to the effect that he was brought in afterwards by the feds back into Massachusetts to, you know, the Barnesville House of Correction, the Essex House of Correction. But he was facing a long sentence. He knew he was being taken out of state at some point, potentially. He could have been released to another state. But when and he's in custody, what does it matter where he does his time? He isn't forming roots in the community or meeting people in the community when he's in custody. No, but he's also, but at the same time, he is also losing all of his roots in the community. You're hey, pulling him out of his home. His family is still here. I thought we your argument that. was you don't even get there because he isn't, he wasn't sentenced by a state court. He was sentenced by a jurisdiction that is not part of what the sex offender registry deals with. No, with respect to him, I'm sorry. I assume we were talking about the hypothetically if he had been in <coughs> Massachusetts Why and identified. Why do you even need to go there? I mean, I, I guess I... I, I guess the concern, I, I, the concern raised by the Sex Offender Registry Board is if they're not allowed to rely on someone's incarceration as a basis to satisfy the residency requirement, I, they, they suggest that perhaps they'll have a whole host of problems of classifying, you know, offenders now because there, there, might, there might be some debatable issue as to whether or not they have jurisdiction. Um, as a matter of fact, if someone is serving um, state time but serves it in Texas because of an agreement because we're subject to overcrowding and we send our people to Texas, are they released in Texas or brought back here and released here? I, I, I'm not sure, Your Honor, about that. Well, doesn't that create a real problem then? Um, because people, I mean, I don't know where they're released either, but if they're released in Texas, they, my assumption would be they would come back here to live if all their roots were here, as in this case, and then the board um, would never have an opportunity to classify them. Well, as soon as, well, the presumption is that, any, that as soon as he comes back in here, he's at least subject to all of the sex offender registry laws and the registration requirements. Well, how is he subject to it if there hasn't been a classification here? Well, um, just because you haven't been classified doesn't mean you're not necessarily subject to those rules. But I, there's nothing wrong with the board starting this process and at least putting this issue on the table clearly where there's conflicting information. But I, I, we also have to think about <coughs> what happens with people who are simply incarcerated in Massachusetts who, who have never lived here and who have no intent to live but here. But that isn't raised by this case. I don't understand But it that. implicates the, the standard that the Sex Offender Registry Board is advancing. How could they start the process if they don't have subject matter jurisdiction? In this case, you mean? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure why, sir. I think there, I'm, I'm assuming there was an error by the Sheriff's Department in forwarding information to sex offender registry. And why wouldn't they have subject matter jurisdiction? They have subject matter jurisdiction. It's not like they're trying to classify somebody who never committed a sex offense. Correct. But so why wouldn't this, why wouldn't this be subject matter jurisdiction? Because 
they have subject matter or definition over sex offenders. And 178C defines a sex offender as a person who has committed a requisite sex offense, resides in Massachusetts, has a secondary address in Massachusetts, attends the requisite schooling, or works in Massachusetts. It doesn't Not doesn't past it? residents, not people who are incarcerated. People who live amongst the public or invoke those concerns where they have contact with the public and present a danger. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ben Zaken. <coughs> Ms. Van Meek. <coughs> Your Honors, Beatrice Van Meek for the uh, Sex Offender Registry Board. It may be helpful to the court to refer back to a case cited to um, by the um, by the uh, board, the court, uh, the case of Bolton versus Krantz. In that case, the um, Supreme Judicial Court did hold that in the case of a prison inmate, he can live both where he maintained his domicile prior to his incarceration and the place where he is being incarcerated. Uh, so. It would be our position that the board appropriately exercised jurisdiction over this individual, Mr. Ben, uh, excuse me, uh, Doe in this case, uh, having found that he resided either permanently or temporarily in Massachusetts at the time of his hearing, and having committed an enumerated Massachusetts, a Massachusetts enumerated sex offense as sex offenses defined under Section 178C. So your position is that it's sufficient if he is incarcerated here. Your Honor, it would be our position that as long as he's incarcerated within com the Commonwealth, it would be. What if uh, somebody commits, lives in Ohio all his life, commits an offense, a sex offense in Ohio, um, and then is shipped for some reason by the feds here to do time here? Our SOAB would have jurisdiction over him? It, is, um, it has been our experience, Your Honor, in dealing with those types of individuals. That what's the answer to the question, yes or no? Would the board have jurisdiction over that? Would the board assert? Could the board validly assert jurisdiction over that person? It could validly assert it if he, uh, if he claims a post-release uh, address in no, Massachusetts. No, 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 Justice Cowan's thing was simply saying, not claiming post-release, mm -hmm. because that's the, the very point that Mr. Ben Zaken has raised, is only here, perhaps for the same, I mean, take the Texas example. Crime in Massachusetts, resident in Massachusetts, picked up in Massachusetts, indicted in Massachusetts, tried in Massachusetts, sentenced in Massachusetts, and he's in Texas because of overcrowding in Massachusetts, and that's by arrangement between the Department of Collections in Massachusetts and the Department of Collections in Texas. Can, so you flip that on its head. Mm -hmm. uh, can the Texas SOAR board with the same statute and so on as Massachusetts assert jurisdiction when the only reason is that he is in custody in Texas? By virtue of a contract between the states, the answer would be yes, Your Honor, just like the federal authorities who have a contract with What's the state. What's the language in the Massachusetts statute that would permit that to happen? Well, Your Honor, 18 U.S.C. 440. No, 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 no. the Massachusetts statute. Well, he would be deemed to be residing here. We would be sharing custody of the individual by virtue so of the contractual are arrangement. So if you are serving time, and that's the basis of, the, of, as I understand it, the jurisdictional claim, if the only basis and I take it that's Sorb's position. Uh, so let's just flip the facts. Texas resident commits a crime in Texas, indicted in Texas, taken before a Texas jury, convicted in Texas, sentenced in Texas um, to a prison term of incarceration, and is shipped to Massachusetts only to serve his Texas sentence but is in Massachusetts because of overcrowding in Texas, it's the board's position that you can assert jurisdiction over him to classify him as a sex offender, am I, I correct? If there is a, a contractual agreement, I'd say it presents a prima facie case in favor of beginning the classification process, yes. No, well, the answer is that you can assert jurisdiction over him. That's right. And what's the piece of the Massachusetts statute, the Massachusetts statute on which you rely? Your Honor, that portion of the statute which allows somebody who has a secondary address in Massachusetts, in other words, a temporary residence. Just, what, what's, the, what's the specific statutory reference? It's, it's 178C definition of the secondary address, Your Honor. In, in, in the prison, or the, the House of Correction, or the prison address is the secondary address? The, that's right, Your Honor. L uh, taking aside so, his so, prior contacts. So if contacts. somebody from Alaska happens to be attending a convention in Boston, and that's the only reason they're here, have never had a con any contact with Massachusetts, commits a sex offense in Massachusetts, is sentenced and is serving time in Massachusetts with the intent to go back to uh, Alaska upon release, SORB can commence proceeding against that person. 
If you read the um, provision for secondary addresses, technically they could, Your Honor, as a could matter of- Could you just point to your brief where that reference is in the appendix? It's 178E. It's, it's page what? 30, it's on page 31 and 32 of, uh, this is of the blue brief. Is oh, I'm statement. asking the uh, Assistant Attorney General to point it out in her red <coughs> brief. Your Honor, it would be under the definition of a secondary address under 178C, secondary addresses. Yes, where is that in your brief? One seventy eight C appears in uh, on page twenty five, Your Honor. Is it in your appendix? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. In the appendix, uh, the um, on page twenty five of your brief. Of my brief, yes. It just says C one seventy eight C S E E one seventy eight C, but it doesn't. Point me to the language of 178C, does it? Uh, well, the 178C is all inclusive of all definitions. No, no, I just am asking you to point out to me where it is in your brief. Well, 178C identifies res resides, and part of the definition for resides would be secondary addresses, at that, as that definition is contained am in 178C. Am I correct that 178C is not included in your brief? Uh, that's right, Your Honor. Could you check your certificate of compliance and make sure that when you sign a certificate of compliance, it in fact complies with the rules of appellate procedure? <coughs> I mean, not now, but after the argument. Yes, Your Honor. So the, w w what is the specific language of 178C on which you're relying? Uh, for the hypothetical that was posed, Your Honor, that would be the uh, definition of a secondary address under 178C. And what is that definition? The definition of a secondary address, Your Honor, is an address in which an individual um, has lived, uh, uh, has taken up as an abode or lodged in, uh, for an aggregate of 14 days in a 30-day period or has lived in uh, for four consecutive days. In the situation Justice Spina raises um, where someone may be in for work, a similar uh, definition is for working in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It's not just by virtue of coming in and attending a convention, for instance, although I know there was more to your hypothetical than that. Uh, there is a minimum threshold in order to be working for definition of, uh, for purposes of exercising jurisdiction over an, over an individual who comes into the Commonwealth for work purposes. Could I ask, you, you may not know the answer to this, but I'm looking at 178EA, mm -hmm. um, and it's talking about within five days of receiving uh, upon sentence any sex offender, the agency which has custody of the sex offender. Um, does the board consider, or is custody a, a term of art? In other words, Mr. Benzakin says, because uh, this uh, John Doe was a federal in federal custody, in fact, the, the um, was it Barnstable? Barnstable, yes, yeah. Your Honor. The Barnstable House of Correction did not have custody of him because he really was in the custody of the of the uh, federal prison authorities. Is is that word defined anywhere in in, in any relevant place? No, Your Honor, that term is meant to mean custody as in any custody. All custodial agents are to report anybody who's transferred into their custody, and it's not, it does custody. not limit what custody and means. You, and you say that's what it's intended to mean based on? Based what? on the common usage of custody in the incarceration um, context, Your Honor. So that would include detainees as well as inmates. And you're absolutely right, all custodial agents are required to report to the Sex Offender Registry Board any transfers into their facility, which is what Barnstable did in this situation. So, and so as a matter of practice, every time, because I know there are a fair number of federal inmates who are spread around the Commonwealth, you get, insofar as they may have committed a sex offense somewhere, you get all that information? The board that, gets all that's right, Your, Your Honor. Um, in fact, this individual actually was processed originally. The first year he was in the Commonwealth, he was <coughs> within the state correctional system at Oak Colony. He was subsequently transferred to Essex. And, and all that information and this came all to you? Became available to the, um, to the board, and it wasn't until he reached Barnesville County House Correction that classification process began. Ms. Van Mee, could I just ask you about that uh, 178? Uh, EA, the same one that Justice Botts is referring to, says upon sentence. I take it that the sheriffs and uh, various other pe persons are not sending in people prior to uh, pre-trial in Massachusetts, correct? 
it actually um, it speaks to those who are sentenced and it also speaks to those that are transferred in and that's not specific and or limited to just those that are sentenced. It's open to interpretation whether or not that is subject to um, only sentenced <coughs> um, individuals and it would be our position that it does not limit it to sentenced okay, individuals. And again, where, which language of 178EA are you referring to? If so your honor continues on in 178EA, it states, all custodial agents notify the board of any transfers of sex offenders into their custody so that the board can establish and maintain contact with the offender throughout the classification process. Right, but of sex offenders surely you'll see, refers back to sex offenders who have been determined to be sex offenders, correct? That's right. But the, the offense flows from the conviction. These individuals are already sex offenders by the time they've come into this, under this provision. Um, under the transfer provision, so. So if he has not been sentenced, he's, he's here in federal custody where he has not yet been sentenced? On a drug trafficking offense, yes. But that's separate and distinct from the sex offense that uh, triggers the registration obligation under the law. What is your <coughs> position as to when the classification hearing should take place? Well, Your Honor, the, um, the uh, Legislature has mandated that the board begin classification not less than 60 days prior to their earliest release, well, to their release from incarceration or custody. Uh, the, um, the statute goes on to state that um, all classifications are to, um, are to be concluded 10 days prior to the earliest possible release date. So that's the framework under which the board operates. Uh, to the extent it says not less than 60 days prior to, uh, the board tries as much as it can, understanding that the, the um, uh, release dates are very fluid, to try to come within a reasonable period of time prior to those 60 days. But, but, but they also, um, well, some of the things they would take into consideration, that the board would take into consideration, was whether or not, as an inmate, the person participated in certain rehabilitative programs and things like that. And, and doesn't the statute kind of require the board to focus on a person's current mental status? Absolutely, Your Honor, and in this particular... So, so doesn't that seem to suggest that it should be, at least for due process purposes, later rather than sooner? Yes, Your Honor, I would agree with that. And in fact, uh, in this particular instance, the, um, the uh, petitioner in this case presented no evidence, notwithstanding the fact he had been incarcerated for years and had access to programs, that he had been involved in any sex offender treatment. In fact, there was no evidence that he um, participated in sex offender treatment. But prior how to do his we arrest. know what he, this man wasn't released, I gather, for about three more years, right? Uh, that's my understanding, So yes. how do we know what programs he's going to be in, what his mental state will be, how did the board know what his mental state would be, what programs he would have completed, where he was going to reside, anything um, three years prior to his release? I mean, what it, what it seems to me like a conundrum, but what is the board supposed to do and what are we supposed to do? Well, Your Honor, the, um, at a minimum, they should be presenting evidence as to what they are doing, and he presented no evidence of any programmatic this participation. Man, the, this offense was committed when he was 15 years old. The man is now 33. I mean... It, He's in jail for something having nothing to do with this. Why would he be doing sex offender treatment on a, on a, why would the prison allow him to do sex offender treatment when he's imprisoned for a traffic, a drug offense? I mean, it just, there's well, a disconnect there. Well, Your Honor, even if uh, the, the um, House of Correction wouldn't allow him to go into sex offender treatment, let's assume that for argument's sake, he's still not presenting any evidence of any other programmatic involvement or any, he presented no evidence why whatsoever. Why would he be seeking that? This is 15 years later. Because he'd want to show that his behavior in custody has been, is, has been good and therefore showing... Behavior in custody means he's got no disciplinary offenses. But he didn't even present that much. He but presented nothing. why is that nothing. relevant to a determination of whether he, pr he presently poses a risk of sex offense? Because it would show some, some measure of... Um, of uh, of change in his behavior. This is an individual who historically has had problems abiding by the law, has had behavioral issues all throughout DYS, even post-incarceration in the six years between the time he was released from DYS custody and he was arrested. We have multiple violations of probation. He's reincarcerated. There's no showing of any stability even post-DYS. True of 95% of people who are in jail, but we don't make them register as sex offenders. But, Your Honor, they at least put forward information regarding changes in their behavior that would warrant um, 
the board's consideration in showing that the risk for reoffense has been reduced. And in fact, in this case, he was classified a level two because he was given the benefit that a lot of uh, that several years had gone on. In fact, the, the uh, hearing examiner's decision specifically says it. It occurred 13 years ago. He gave him credit for that. The petitioner was 15 years old at the time. He gave him credit for that. He gave him credit for the fact that you know the offense involved a low amount oh, of physical it's hard contact. To see. How about no? I mean. Well, that's within the hearing examiner's discretion, Your Honor, and he, the petitioner isn't helping himself by presenting absolutely no evidence. So it would be the board's position that in, in this case, the hearing examiner had only historical information from which to work. If the petitioner isn't going to be putting in any other information, the board's hands are tied as to what else it could consider. And with that, Your Honors, um, I would request. I could have one more question. Of course, uh, just right. Let's imagine this individual was in state custody. Had not been had been charged, but was simply awaiting trial. Does the board move while he's still awaiting trial? Is he awaiting trial on the governing sex offense or on an trial unrelated matter? The matter? same type of offense. It's a drug offense. Drug Let's trial, assume yeah, drug it's offense. same the same yeah. situation. He's charged with he's charged with the, with the drug offense, not federal but state. He's away. He's in Barnstable House of Correction, awaiting trial. Does the board move at that time? <clears throat> it could move at that time to so exercise you, jurisdiction over You can over move him. even before a person's been sentenced, even before 178E requires the, the prison to make notice to the SORB about his, his presence there. Well, we wouldn't know unless the House of Correction notified the us. The House tells you he is in jail now awaiting trial. He could be released at any time because the DA may decide to drop charges. Do you ever proceed against those persons? We do, Your Honor, but keep in mind that oftentimes those classifications, because they can be immediately released from prison on a suspended sentence, those, um, those proceedings, he's entitled to his due process, so he's given that. We may not reach final classification before he's released from custody, so we have to continue the process um, um, once he's released, so it would basically carry over to his time um, in the community. But, you, but if he's held for a long time, you potentially could move to final classification even before he has reached trial. On a drug offense in this particular instance, correct? Right. Yes, yes. But that only goes to the registration issue. That doesn't affect his, um, his, his issue regarding the drug trafficking well, or anything. It's not. separate I mean, and distinct. But he be classified a level two even though he has not reached trial on his drug yes. case. Yes, yes. Thank you, Thank Ms. You, Your Honor. I want to point out to all counsel here that this court takes very seriously certifications of compliance uh, with rules of appellate procedure. Um, on numerous occasions, those certifications are made and the briefs are not in compliance. I hope that if there are any counsel present whose briefs are not in compliance <coughs> and who have filed such a certification, that they will file amended briefs. Thank you.